Hello, I'm Richard Fox, chef, writer and presenter, and I'm delighted to be hosting this Winning Insights video panel on behalf of William Reed Exhibitions. Um, over the next half an hour, our experts will debate and discuss the unprecedented events of the last three months or so in relation to their own experiences, with the aim of giving you an insight, ideas and inspiration for going forward in what we know now as the new normal. Um, for this inaugural video event, we've assembled three of the UK's leading speciality food retailers, all of them winners of the prestigious Farm Shop and Deli Awards Food Retailer of the Year. And I'm delighted to welcome, first of all, Debbie Edge, co-proprietor, hello Debbie, of Edge and Sons Butchers and winners of Radio 4's Food and Farming Awards 2014 Retailer of the Year. And of course, Farm Shop and Delhi Awards Retailer of the Year 2018. Debbie, welcome. Thank you for giving up your time and joining us. Andy Swinsco, give us a wave, Andy. There you go. Uh, proprietor of the Courtyard Dairy, um, listed in the Times Top 15 Cheese Shops. Farm Shop and Delhi Awards Retailer of the Year this year, no less, um, 2020. Congratulations, Andy. Um, Thank you. I'm sorry you weren't able you. to be there in person to collect the awards. Maybe next time. <laughs> Always the way. Um, <laughs> and uh, last but definitely not least, um, Anthony Johns, proprietor of Johns of Insto, winner of Devon Life Food Retailer of the Year, and of course, Farm Shop and Delhi Awards Retailer of the Year 2015. Um, welcome, all of you. Um, and thanks Thank you. so much guys, for, for giving up your time in what must be an extremely demanding and difficult period, which we will be talking about in due course. Um, first of all, before we look at the, the challenges and the, the changes and the decisions you've had to make over the last couple of months, um, I just want you to, in turn, briefly summarise your businesses, your business models pre-COVID-19, just to contextualise what we're going to be uh, talking about. So, Debbie, I don't know if you want to start off there. Uh, yeah, we're a, a, a little butcher's business in the north northwest of England on the Wirral, and um, we are quite unique in that we have our own abattoir. Um, so we really are a farm-to-fork um, retailer. Uh, prior to COVID taking off, we were 30, about third re restaurant trade, a third retail trade, and a third farmer trade. So we'd pr produce, uh, we'd slaughter, butcher, and pack for farmers for their farm gate uh, businesses. So obviously the, with COVID happening to us, the 33% of restaurants disappeared overnight. And our, our task was really to nurture that retail or, or that part of our business. And of course, look after our farmers as we could. So you've obviously had to make huge adjustments, um, certainly, which we'll talk about shortly. Yeah, massive, massive adjustments. And, and really for us, it was that we knew very, very quickly that uh, the customers weren't necessarily going to come to us. And, uh, and so we had to go to them. So we've launched um, a home delivery service. And of course, our connection with our restaurants still is, is retained. We've had to support them a lot in whatever the plans they've had in, in diversifying and, and in, in their lives, because they've been through hell, let's face it. Andy, I'm, I'm sure you've had um, similar experiences to Debbie. So just give us an overview of, of what your business looked like pre-COVID. Yeah, so we, we specialise just really in cheese and just do traditional farmhouse cheese, and mainly raw milk, and work with independent farmers. So about 30 farms we work with. And our, the core of our business was retail, really. So we about 55% of our business is retail, and that's really the, the, the bread and butter. That's where our business relied on for to keep it going, really. We had about another 10% of our cafe, um, which is which is important as a draw for our business, but not really the, the, the key business. And the rest was split equally between wholesale to restaurants and mail order, which we did direct to customers. Um, so that was where we were sitting at, at pre the pre COVID, really. Um, yeah, and then it all changed overnight, pretty much. Absolutely. Um, and Anthony, again, a similar experience. What, what did your business model look like? Um, we've got um, two stores, um, which we develop up to three in the uh, season because um, we have um, a beach site as well. So kind of our model was about to change into we go from being a, um, um, a winter retailer to a local trade to a summer retailer to visitors and tourists. 
Um, our business model is somewhere around about 30 to 40 percent cafe um, and the balance 60 percent sort of um, people coming in through the door into the delis. So, so yeah, that's a, that's a big um, reliance, isn't it, on the cafe? So that must have, mm. have hit you hard. It was. Um, yeah. and, well, so if I can take you all back, so in the in the days um, immediately prior to lockdown, and I hope this isn't taking you into sort of a bad mm. dream um, realm, but um, you know we're all looking at what's happening in in our, with our European neighbours. You know we can potentially see what is is about to arrive. What was your approach at that time? Was it? Did you decide that you were going to create a strategy that you were going to stick to going forwards, or was it something that you decided you would allow to evolve on a day-to-day -day basis and make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, Debbie, perhaps if I can go back to you again. Well, we were in South Africa, luckily enough. Um, well, for us, it was lovely. It was a holiday um, from the third to the eleventh of March. And uh, so we were listening to this at a far and I think it was on the plane on the way back. I said to Callum, tomorrow we're going to launch home deliveries. And he said, tomorrow? And, you know, as, as, as a little business, you can do that. Whereas I think we definitely benefited from the, uh, the um, supermarkets inability to move their huge tankers. We just turned to home delivery. Uh, we kept our doors open as well. And uh, the, those frenzied weeks that everybody was panic buying and not being able to get into the supermarkets, not, not being able to get home deliveries quickly from the supermarkets, uh, we gained an awful lot of immediate loyalty and love from new customers and obviously our old loyal customers. So it, it was great. It was that quick. I don't think there was a strategy. It certainly very quickly made us realize that this is a, a great opportunity to get to know new customers um, for the future and we fully intend to continue this throughout and we've already um, got to a situation where we've got lovely um, temperature control packaging that when people start going out and and start going back to work etc that we can deliver to their workplace or their home when they're not in and in a 30 degree day like it is today uh, the, the meat will be come to them at fresh temperature. So that's we. So we're already there, and we're already using the packaging, which is great. That's interesting that you you took a, a positive attitude from from day one, or, or day minus one even. Yeah, it's funny uh, talking to the lads uh, this week, uh, uh, and we I, I guess we didn't realise at the time it never crossed our minds that we'd ever consider closing a door. And of course, of course, it might happen still. We could all go down with COVID. So so it, it could happen, but it's never crossed our mind that we, we would. Uh, but of course, there is fear from the staff and, and uh, whether we might have to close the doors, are their jobs safe? And, and all of that has gone through the whole country. Uh, but yeah, from, from our perspective as, as owners of the business, we were in food and we were key workers and the staff have just jumped in on that and have been amazing. Anthony, I'm, I'm guessing uh, it might have been a bit more difficult for you because you had no choice but obviously to, to close the cafe going forwards. I mean, was this something you were aware of was, was going to happen um, just in the days prior to the lockdown? Um, it was really strange because, well, a couple of weeks before, Debbie, you were in South Africa and I was up and I went and met Andy and we've been travelling around uh, the UK for a couple of weeks uh, visiting other farm shops and things. And But when we kind of came back and it was the following weekend and it was announced that we were you know things were starting to kick off um the shops went extremely busy um from selling from their shelves being cleared we didn't look much different to what a little looked um in the fact that our shelves had been stripped of everything that we had and it and you suddenly thought all oh, the trade's going to rock it and then they announced i think the following day that cafes had to close and we actually, we actually did consider whether we should shut. Um, something to, partly to do with the the, the shape of the premises um, that we have, and also the fact that customers come into us. Um, you know, people a bit, you know, have to jump in their cars and travel, and we were a destination um, um, where you would come to for an experience. Um, so the kind of thing that we were doing and we were keen on doing with from our cheese to our cafe to all that kind of 
people were told not to get in your car and drive and um and and not to come to you so we didn't have an online pre um, presence at all at that point um so we furloughed roughly around about 40 percent of our team um we went straight to doing home deliveries um we had people phoning up that were you know that were almost um that were pleading that that or so help I'm sort of that's not the right way grateful that we could uh, look after them um and um you know we were delivering to them but it was back to pen and paper it was having in 25 kilo sacks of flour and um hand and handling that again which was something very strange so you know we I can honestly say that I think as a business owner we've never made such quick decisions on mm. anything ever and I've also I've never worked so hard or had so much pressure than what i've experienced this last month it's been i'm not saying it's it's you know we're all going to get i think something um the industry may in the long term get some benefit from it but it was extremely tough whilst we were going through it all but. i mean that's a huge decision to have to make it in those first few days of do you stay open or do you close um mm -hmm. any regrets about your decision no None at all. No, no. no. I mean, uh, you you mentioned about staff. I mean, the teams have been amazing. The ones that have been on furlough have been in contact. We've kept in contact with them as well. Um, the customers have been really loyal and um, supportive. And the staff that we've we've kept, yes, they've there's been some concerns, and but we've put all the measures in place. We've been there on the shop floor. 24 7 basically mm -hmm. and working that and putting um queuing systems in place outside and that kind of thing um yeah i want to talk about people... stuff actually after, after this that's really interesting i mean yeah. and andy was did you have to face did you face similar decisions or was it always like yeah. you know, we, we go on we move forwards and upwards yeah, and there is a bit of that. I mean we did there was i remember there was one morning when we would i was that close to, to closing because um, you know, a couple of key members of staff were, were had to self isolate. You know, on that on that morning, and it was just basically me left in the cheese shop, and it was just, it was a tough tough day that day. But you know, in turn, looking back, it was it, it was a tough couple of weeks. You know, I think we got hit very early. Um, we are a definite drive to destination. We're not near any city. You know, um, we rely a little bit on local trade, but we also rely on a lot of passing. We're on a main road. We rely an awful lot on passing trade. Um, which some of that is regular, but it's all people going to work or coming back from work, you know, which had all gone. And and overnight we went from doing, you know, we, we were doing a thousand customers a week to thirty customers a week, um, and that was before lockdown. So we got hit well before lockdown. And luckily, I worked in cheese for quite a few years, and and I had spoken to a few uh, Italian cheese shops and Spanish cheese shops that that I knew, and they'd kind of told us what had happened in the stages and to be fair when I've looked back it, it's been exactly the same they're like first there's the panic buy-in you know first and then that was slack off then you and then and it, were, it's just exactly the same but we didn't really have any panic buy-in because we are very specialists that's how one of our weaknesses is that you know and we did decided early on not to diversify because for us we work with 30 farms and we're known for doing really good cheese and really amazing cheese but we wanted to kind of get those farms through as well. Some of them we take all of their production and we didn't want to just kind of, oh, so we'll, we'll sell that because we can and that be, we, we just know we need to concentrate on getting this cheese into people's brains and getting it out. Um, so it's really different. So we spoke to our staff in the cafe well before they closed the cafes that, well, this is going to happen because we've been in contact with those in Italy. And, and so they were aware of it. And the main stage early on was for us trying to work out the finances so we could afford to pay them. Um, and then luckily about a week into that, the furlough scheme came in, which was, a big, yeah. big relief. Um, and then it was just about changing fast. We, uh, in some regards, we're lucky I live on site. So we, we, we never closed the shop, but doing three customers a day, we would have closed the shop if I didn't live on site and we had a doorbell where people can come and ring a doorbell and I can literally pop round from the office or from, from being out the back with my kids and pop round and, and, and serve them, you know? So we have a, <laughs> that's helped us a lot in that we enabled us to keep the shop open. But we knew- I think, I think that, one of the- yeah. Sorry, go on, Andy. We knew early on that the only way we were going to survive was to really push that mail order, and and, and that was literally the only way we would survive um, because even local deliveries wouldn't be enough for us. We do do local deliveries, but it would have to be nationwide deliveries mm -hmm. for us, and that was the only way we were going to survive.
Um, but yeah. I think one of the key things that's coming across here, um, hearing what all three of you have got to say, is, is simply is mental agility. And, and I'm sure that those are, are skills you employed from, from the very beginning, you know, to get to the point where you, you're winning these awards and so forth. And, and I think that's probably one of the great strengths that the speciality retailer has um, is that ability to to change and adapt at a moment's notice, which obviously the, the big operators just don't have those sort of options available to them. Um, so, yeah, I mean, staff, we come on to staff next. So that, it must have been a scary time. I mean, particularly before the government announced uh, the furlough scheme, which I imagine also must have been an immense relief. I mean, you all must, you know, staff a key to this business. How did you um, approach talking to the staff? I mean, obviously, they've got their own fears. They're watching the news the same as you are. They don't know what's going to happen the same as you don't know. Um, Debbie, how did you approach the, the staff situation in the early days? Uh, we talked through everything, uh, any change that we talked through with the team. So uh, we, we just did that. And so we were all working it out together. And so we've all been on board all the way through. I think that's the key, and that's the benefit as well of, of a small team. You can do that. It's more, very much more difficult in these big organisations where you've got layers and hundreds of people. We haven't got that. So, um, yeah, I, you know, a great, determined, passionate team with a will to win, and it's, it's been great. Um, and Anthony, what about yourself? I mean, you must have had to lay off, you know, more stuff, I imagine, than perhaps um, but De Debbie and Andy, given the cafe situation? Well, um, yeah, um, the the further scheme was a big benefit. Layoff is definitely the wrong word because they're still... Sorry, very yes, much absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> still very much employed. Um, yeah, we've actually good, we, good. We've, brought, we've had two back um, today, in actual fact, off a of furlough. So we're, as we're starting to open back up in full now, um, Sue and myself, my wife Sue, um, who um, you would know, um, we both went and personally spoke to everybody um, individually. And uh, yeah, it was a bit of a moving moment to go and tell people that yeah, it, it was. I mean, I, I think it shows that how much we all love our businesses and how much we they all mean to us. And uh, and they they felt it. You know, they could feel they could feel the pain that, that I think that as retailers and owners we were feeling at, at the time. You know, not knowing what was around the corner really. Um, but we're, you know, we're we're in contact with them, or we've been in contact with them every few days. We send them uh, team messages and keeping them in contact where we are. And we're already, so we've um, already brought back two now. Off of the, uh, we had about, I, I'm not exactly sure of the numbers, but about twelve on furlough. Um, and we're we're now that's down to sort of well now ten, and it'll be changing again next week because we're yeah. trades changing again rapidly. We're We've lost that. Our customer numbers have dropped off by, say, 60%. Now our customer numbers are, are still down by about 30%, but our average spend is dropping again because there's a lot more people coming back through the door, um, you know, just buying smaller amounts. When all this happened, our, our customer spend went up by about 150% overnight, but the customer numbers dropped by 70%. Um, I mean, this is the thing, is but, it's the speed of change that mm. everybody's been experiencing is, is absolutely um, unprecedented, let alone anything else. I mean, Andy, does what the other two are saying resonate with you as well regarding your, the staff situation? Yeah, I think for us, it was, it was um, we talked to them early on and then we kept in, in contact with them. And, and we, we also explained to them uh, who we were following and why. For example, we followed like our general manager, who, to be honest with you, we could do with um, in, in terms of in the business, but we made a, a business decision that it was better to keep maybe a couple of members of cafe staff to help us with the packing side than the general manager, so that he was separate from the whole team should we go down with corona. And he, he lives about 40 minutes away, he's in a separate community. And we did the same with one of our key packing team members as well. So we tried to actually split the following and keep some of the cafe staff and change their role so that some of those who were more qualified in other areas could come back if think, if we went down with, we were always aware that not only it's just about following certain people, but actually keeping some key members for load um, yeah. bit, so that they could come back if things went down. And the other thing with the staffing side is we were aware that our business, we spend an awful lot, we have great staff that are in this a long time, 
and we spent an awful lot of time training them and having fun and talking about cheese uh, and going to visit cheesemakers. And we were aware that the new role was um, not quite as enjoyable. We're literally putting bits of cheese in a box now, whereas we, you know, whereas before, man, where we're <laughs> tasting the cheese, we're talking about it, you know, we're visiting the producers. So we thought we we have to make the environment that we've got left a bit more exciting, a bit more better. So we're doing a, like really good stuff meals every day. We up that, but we also try and do once a week. We get all the stuff together um, and we do a focus on the cheese and we talk about it as a group still, just to try and keep that in the business uh, that 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 we've always had. But we've we've changed now to literally just back in mail order, but to try and keep that love for cheese with the cheesemongers, because right? that's the difficult part with the staff as well. We don't want to lose that. Um, we don't want them to get disheartened. It's effectively factory work now, whereas before and it was yeah. a very enjoyable uh, retail work. So it's um, that's another thing with the staff we're trying to manage. I think what's interesting as well about what, what's happened over, over these last couple of months is it's like putting a magnifying glass to, to any business, I guess. I mean, are there, did it lay bare any particular... Um, strengths uh, or weaknesses in, in your business model that that either helped or hindered you and that you could either capitalize upon going forward you know or force to climb and address uh, going forwards um, Debbie maybe we can start with you again yeah, yeah uh, um, we had a we've had some great times with our farmers uh, we have a massive uh, uh, farmer base who are very very loyal and in the beginning, when there was a frenzy, they were being approached by all sorts of people to buy their stock, and they were they stayed loyal to us um, because they know we're that they're committed to our values of nose to tail, of native breeds, of grass feeding, etc. And uh, and they wanted that relationship to continue. So we've been very lucky with a fantastic group of farmers who have been very loyal to us. But that supply chain of just us and them farmers and butcher is just perfect so when the supermarket shelves are, are are emptying our suppliers is just coming off the field it's always been there it's still there it's and you know our september october in next year's stock is is in the field now so we we've uh, enjoyed that um um privilege really to uh to work in in the, the exact business we do of of having such a short supply chain and is that a similar for you, Andy, as well? I imagine it, it's uh, it's quite um, a close uh, parallel for you. Yeah, in some regards, that it was really good in that regard because you can, I mean, in some regards, when they struggled in early on because the whole loss of the restaurant trade, but for us, it's only about 15, 20% of our business. But in terms of farmhouse cheese, it can be up to 70% for some people. Um, and so even though we were still taking that, that it was a real real difficulty so they, they having that close relationship and speaking to them made us all realize pretty quick that we were gonna have to really push british cheese in order to get it to people's brains and and, mm -hmm. and i think that what it also meant is that we all linked up so i linked up with the farmers but then we also linked up with other cheese retailers so we spoke to people like Niels our dairy and the cheese geek and cheese society and we came up with a effectively we all do a very similar thing but you know at different levels and at, at different ways we came with like a concerted effort to push British cheese and, you know, all those boundaries of competition between cheesemongers just become, became nothing because it, we needed to support the farmers that we all relied on. Yeah. And, and and that got it onto the front pages and got it onto the news. Whereas if I had just tried it or Niels Yard or Dairy had just tried it and, you know, but together we had much more strength. And I think having that link with the farmers uh, really, really, really did help. And I mean, this, I guess, just um, enforces this whole issue of the global supply chain and is maybe going forward is, is making us look even more and more at, at local and being self-sufficient and supporting our own communities and, and suppliers. And is this something that resonates with you as well, Anthony? Yeah, I mean, well, there's been some, we've had some amazing suppliers that have come out of all of this and some, um, I wouldn't say new relationships, but you suddenly realise that, you know, how you can ramp things up with local stuff. You know, we've got a, a guy down the road that's been supplying us with um, asparagus recently, and, and that's been such a treat for everybody. And the amount, the volume of that that we've sold this year compared to what we would have previous years has been tenfold. Um, so whereas you lose on something else, you know, you see the important things and you stop you people, um, what people have been buying as well, you know, everybody's making bread now, everybody's, uh, yeah. what is it? We, we worked it out the other day, 
we've sold um, around about 90 kilos, I think, of yeast since this has happened, dried yeast. That That's more yeast than what I've most prob- probably have sold in 30 years, have sold in a month. Yeah. And where that yeast has gone, I haven't got a clue, but the amount of people that are now baking bread or cooking at home and, you know, you can – or and also up, up, they're buying nicer things. You know, they're buying better wines. They're buying – more yeah. interesting things they're willing to uh, i don't think people's pockets have actually been hurt yet or they don't feel like it um whether they will long term i'm not sure but people are certainly enjoying the treats um we just reopened our our coffee bar um properly last week in both shots and the customers coming in um and we work with a local roaster for that and they just come in and they're just so pleased that uh, to get a, something some quality again um out of it so uh yeah um, i think the long-term prognosis is going to be okay for us all but. i think it is and actually it's interesting what you say there because i i feel that it's sort of opened our eyes to, to rampant consumerism you know the fact that economies have collapsed to such a degree simply by a, 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 few, a couple of months of, of people not maybe spending in the, the, a normal retail fashion. Mm. And instead of perhaps wasting money, people are looking at spending their money in, in a different way, enhancing their quality of life, enhancing their, their health and well-being through, through foods and you know, through the experiences that that brings you. Um, and, and you are absolutely at the forefront of, um, of that revolution, should we say. Mm. Um, has COVID-19 made you do things that you perhaps wouldn't have done anyway, but you would wish you had done, even if it hadn't come along? I mean, you've, you, I think maybe you've answered that to, to a certain degree, but maybe we could be more specific on that. Things that, you, that you've done that you wish you would have done anyway. Who's that to, to me? So, oh, so all, uh, whoever all wants of to us. take the question first, all right. of you. Well, well, I'll, I'll Debbie, say that, go on. Yeah. Good, that um, we, uh, we, the mail order had always been kind of the, the little child that just ticked over for us. You know, the retail is where we put our focus. And what the, t- the COVID has maybe realized a couple of things. One is that retail is where, as soon as I can, retail is where I'll continue to put my focus because that customer relationship and the way that it allows us to talk about the cheese and sell cheese is what I love about our business. And um, so, and I feel like in, in, in recent years, the wholesale and the mail order had ticked over and but we focused on that a bit too much. And I think that as soon as we can get back to talking to people, that's one thing that's highlighted mm-hmm. to me is how much I love retail, if that makes sense. Um, <laughs> but B, also highlighted is uh, how inefficient our mail order is because our mail order was always done around the retail. We'd fit it in with the shop and then we'd fit it in and then we'd, we'd get it down to a different packing room. Whereas now we've just mail order effectively because we have so, we are open, but we have so little customers, we just mail order. It highlighted to me all the inefficiencies within our mail order um, because we were just kind of fitting it in, whereas now we're just doing it. And so for us, we ripped out, uh, to make it work, we ripped out our museum and, and we ripped out our cafe to kind of put, create a proper packing line and we put a new container fridge in um, out, outside so we could do better goods out. And what it made me realize is that long term, if, if we want to continue to sustain this and get back to doing more retail and, and put the cheese museum back in, we will need an addition, like almost like a warehouse attached to make it smooth. Because um, what we've been doing and fitting it in has worked, but it's not efficient, if that makes sense. So, it's, um, so that's, that's made us realize that that's, yeah, I think that's what helped us in that regard. Fantastic. Anthony? Yeah, well, I mean, as I think nearly any business, we're all sort of chipping away at the mail order side of it now. And we didn't, we've always had a website, but um, now we've got a, um, a online shop, mainly delivering locally. So we have lots and lots of people now using that. And um, we are then delivering it to them ourselves within like a 20 mile radius. But we're doing roughly around about 30 orders a week um but that's 30 orders that we never had before um we're also now trying to be innovative like with our cafe menus because they're about to all go we're about to sort of launch that now so that you can actually have it and take it away um whereas we've always done like our takeaway was always separate from our cafe the takeaway was always like the poor the the um 
more of a basic offering but now the cafe, what you're gonna what you could have had in the cafe you can actually have that as a full-blown meal soon soon um and take it away so i think that it, it does make you sit back and think um and yeah we're gonna get some uh, i think what you said andy a minute ago is going to be great over time because people will realize how much they've missed the the interaction with coming in and tasting their cheese or coming into an environment that's an emporium um you know we always used to have our, all of our cake displays out open air that's all gone at the moment hopefully one day that'll be back and to create that theater and stuff is so important but when it when it does come back in a form that's going to be a really healthy place for us all because people will 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 realize how specialist that all that is to them and um we've already seen it just by sort of say reopening up our coffee bar and stuff this week um how important that's been to um to people visiting um, um we're in an area where we get a lot of talk of I'm gonna I'm not gonna say tourists because we're not supposed to have tourists at the moment. And, <laughs> and we don't really have tourists. Yeah, but we have a lot of visitors. So yeah. there's a lot of people in the local area that, that love to visit where our locations because we've got beaches and space. So they're coming in from 20, 30 miles away. Um and um, you know, they're 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 loving having the, the quality stuff again and being able to enjoy something that they maybe they can't make at home. I think there's going to be a lot um, more people staying at home for their um, holidays as well in the in the yeah. foreseeable future too, which is, is no bad thing, uh, certainly for your location, um, Anthony. Um, and Debbie, um, f- final word from, from you on that. Yeah, I think uh, your question was about would we have done it? Uh, do you know what? You talk about it all the time, don't you? And little businesses, we're very busy and, you know, trundling through life and these things don't get done. Well, this has got done. So we have launched the home deliveries and we will continue to do that. And it has really been a privilege to um, to serve our, our loyal customers who walk in our shop every week, twice a week, um, and they stagger in, uh, some of them, and it's lovely to be able to deliver their pound of sausages to them. Um, and it's also lovely to uh, to meet new customers. And I think the home delivery thing, I think our, our real aim is to develop our online systems, obviously, because currently we're very inefficient. Um, in fact, we've not only not furloughed anybody, we've taken on more people through this. So again, very privileged to do that. But because it's a very inefficient system at the moment, um, you know, there's a, delivering a, a large lump of meat to a restaurant is a lot more efficient than delivering the same value to 10 homes. So um, in little bags sort of thing. Um, so, but I, th- I think the important thing for us is to move forward with with more online systems, but retaining that personal service and retaining that relationship, which both Andy and Anthony have talked about, because um, that is where we are. That is who we are. And, uh, and that is um, probably all of our unique selling points that we are specialists, we're passionate, we're different. And, and, and we to get that through our websites is i think our next Mm. challenge really well it's wonderful to to finish with such positivity for sure um from all three of you going forwards and that does wrap up our uh, very first winning insights video panel Um, i'd like to say an enormous thank you to all three of you um debbie edge andy swinsco and anthony johns um thank you so much uh for sharing your experience and insights at a no time problem. when I'm sure you've got far better things to be doing. I hope it's been as therapeutic for the three of you as it has been um, informative and um, inspirational for everyone watching and listening. It would be marvellous if you could come back perhaps in a few weeks' time and we talk again to see how things are unfolding um, further. But in the meantime, I wish you and uh, and everyone out there um, every success and um, most of all, good health and happiness. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.